In this tutorial, we're going to talk about how to set up your system to get the most out of Pro Tools. Now, the first thing we're going to look at is we're going to go online and go to the DigiDesign User Conference, which is duc.digidesign.com. If you go there, you can go to either the Pro Tools HD systems or the Pro Tools Native systems area and choose either Mac or Windows for the version of Pro Tools that you're running. So I'm going to go to Pro Tools LE Mac here. And when you go to the, each of those discussions, there's an area right in the beginning that DigiDesign uses to post announcements and basically stick things that they want to be permanent. And right here we have the general troubleshooting discussion. So I'm going to click on that. And this is a great place to go when you're having problems with Pro Tools, but even before you have problems, this is a great way to go because it tells you um, about compatibility. So as you're buying a system, you can check here to see what DigiDesign's qualified. And it also talks about general setups. So you can see they've given you some tips here about energy saver and airport and Bluetooth and networking and drivers and all that good stuff. And they tell you the best way um, to set that up and give you the configurations you need to work smoothly with Pro Tools. So go through this. It's a long one, but it's a really good one. And go ahead and, and match your system settings with the settings that they give you here. That'll go a long way right off the board in getting the most out of Pro Tools. The second thing we're going to look at is in Pro Tools. We're going to go up to the Setup menu, and we're going to choose Playback Engine. Now, not a lot of people know how to really get the most from this dialog, and it's important that you do, because if it's one of those things that you just set and forget, or even worse, if you've never seen this before, then you're really not taking advantage of Pro Tools' full capabilities. And here's what I mean. The things we're going to look at are the hardware buffer size, the RTAS processors, and the CPU limit, and I'll even explain to you what the DAE playback buffers do here. We're going to start with the hardware buffer size. So this is the buffer that's used for your entire system. Basically it's get audio into the computer, process it, and get it out. And the way I like to think of this is if you think of a buffer as a bucket of water with a spigot right at the bottom. The goal is you want to fill that bucket up so that a nice steady stream of water comes out at that spigot. Now, if you keep the water level really high in that bucket, then you're not going to have to work very hard because you're really not in danger of that water level falling below the spigot. So you can kind of take your time as you fill up the bucket. But if you keep that water level just above that spigot, then you've got to work really hard because if you don't get water in there fast enough, then obviously a nice steady stream of water is not going to come out and it's going to get interrupted. And really that's what's going on here. We don't want the audio to get interrupted or to run out for Pro Tools. So here's um, what it means in real life here. Um, you want to choose a low sample count. So 128 samples is a buffer. You want to choose that when you're tracking. So if I'm doing some audio recording or MIDI sequencing, having the lowest buffer that my computer can handle will allow for the lowest latency, so it feels good when I record it. Now, what's the lowest number you can use? Well, that's a tough one. That really does depend on the performance of your computer. Sometimes I can go right to 128 and I can do 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 tracks. And then at some point, I might get a dialog that comes up and says that basically I've overrun the buffer and I need to increase my hardware buffer size. Well, Pro Tools is telling you to come here to the playback engine and it wants you to increase this buffer right there. So maybe you just go up one increment and then you're fine for a while and maybe you just have to increase it. At some point, you will have recorded all of your tracks and this will be as low as it could possibly be. But you see that I don't just pick a number and forget it. I keep it as low as I can as I'm recording, and as Pro Tools tells me through that error dialog that I need to increase it, then I do. Now you take the opposite approach when you're ready to do editing and mixing, and the reason why you do that is if you come up here to like 1024 or even 2048, what this does is it makes the latency worse, but that's okay because we're not recording anymore but it makes the processing better. So that means we can do more RTAS plugins, more VIs when the buffer size is large. When the buffer size is small, we get that low latency, but you really can't do a lot of plugins or doing those plugins will actually throw that air faster. So the way I like to work is I'm not a big fan of putting a lot of plugins on while I track. I like to make it so I can have that lowest possible buffer size. I do all my tracking. I increase it as needed, 
And then when I'm all done tracking, I crank this baby up to 1024, 2048, and then I start putting all my plugins in and start editing and mixing my session. The next one we're going to look at is RTAS processors, and normally you can set and forget this one. I'm on a dual core machine, and on a dual core machine, it's usually no problem to run two processors. Um, if you're on a quad core machine or anything higher than that, it's usually not a good idea to use all of the cores because that doesn't really leave anything else for Pro Tools or the system to utilize. So if I were on a four core, I'd probably bring that down to two or three. And if I were on an eight core, I'd probably bring that down a couple of cores too. It's not that you really uh, miss out on a lot of processing, but it does keep Pro Tools running better and enable you to get better performance out of your virtual instruments. The CPU usage limit. I have seen some people use this at 90. Um, if you have a fast computer, it doesn't seem to be a problem, but I like to leave this one at 85%. Now there is a time when I will actually lower this somewhere between 75 and 50. And that time is when I'm using rewire and I'm using Ableton Live or Propeller Heads Reason simultaneously. Here's the problem. If you leave it at 85 or 90 and you're using one of those apps, you're basically taking all of your computer's resources for Pro Tools and you're not leaving anything for Reason or Live. And that's not a good plan. So by going down to 75, maybe 60, maybe 50, what you're doing is you're leaving resources so that Reason or Live can do its thing and Pro Tools can do its thing. But if you're not using any other application at the same time, usually 85% is a great way to go. Now the RTAS engine ignore errors during playback record. You can turn this on and what it'll do is if Pro Tools drops a sample but you really can't hear it, it'll just keep going as if nothing ever happened. So that's when it's enabled. When you disable it, basically if a sample is dropped, Pro Tools is going to report an error. Now I prefer that because I want to know what I'm recording is of the highest integrity. So I generally don't turn this on, um, but it's fine. Um, other applications like Logic and Digital Performer, they basically kind of have this enabled where if it's not too bad, they really don't stop you from recording. Finally, we have our DAE playback buffer. Now the way this works is it's a buffer, but instead of having to do with your audio system getting audio in and out, it actually has to do with your hard disk. So basically, it's that buffer that how much of your hard disk is it going to have in memory as it plays back. Now generally, I can leave this on level 2, which is the default. The only time I really have to increase it is if I have a bunch of dense editing. So sometimes when I do multi-track drums, I'll use Beat Detective and slice up every little hit there and over you know 12, 14 tracks that really makes for some dense editing. So sometimes when I notice it getting sluggish I just move it up to 4. Now the problem with this is the higher you have it as Pro Tools reads through the timeline it's reading that buffer and it'll take longer for it to update. So a real world example would be is if I selected this region here and did a loop if I trim the loop in if I have a very low setting I might hear that right away. If I have a very high setting, it actually might loop around a time or two before it actually picks up that edit. So if you've ever wondered what that was related to, it's related to this right here. So I'm just going to go ahead and leave that on level two. All right, so those are the main settings that are going to affect your performance in Pro Tools. And what I really recommend is that you come back during the phases of your project. And during tracking, keep this as low as possible. During editing and mixing, keep it as high as possible. If you do that, you really will be optimizing Pro Tools for the situation that you're in at that moment, and that's how you get the most out of your system.